Hey everybody, my name is Kate. I'm here at the Eastside Freedom Library in St. Paul, Minnesota. And as usual, I have three books for you. And the first one is called The Name Jar by Yang Suk Chai. Through the school bus window, Yun Wei looked out at the strange buildings and houses on the way to her new school. It was her first day and she was both nervous and excited. She fingered the little block of wood in her pocket and remembered leaving her grandmother at the airport in Korea. Her grandmother had wiped away Yun Hui's tears and handed her an ink pad and a small red satin pouch. Your name is inside, she had said. My name, Yun Hui had said. Again, she took out the red pouch to look at the wooden block with her name carved in it. As she ran her fingers along the grooves and ridges of the Korean characters, she pictured her grandmother's smile. Is that thing for show and tell? A boy asked Yun Hui, surprising her. Yun Hui looked up as more kids leaned over. No, it's mine, Yun Hui answered, quickly putting it back in her pocket. Are you new here? What's your name? A girl asked. Yun Hui, said Yun Hui. Un ne? A girl asked, scrunching up her face. U u uni? Some kids chanted. No, Yun Hui corrected. It's spelled U N E H E I. It's pronounced Yun Hui. Oh, you hey, the boy said, like you, hey. What about hey you? Just then, the bus pulled up to the school and the doors opened. Yun Wei hurried off to get inside. You hey, bye bye, the kids yelled as she left. Yun Wei felt herself blush. Yun Wei stood in the doorway of her new and noisy classroom. She was relieved that the kids on the bus had gone to other rooms, but her face still felt red. Aren't you going in? asked a curly haired boy with lots of dots on his face. You're the new girl, right? He asked cheerfully. Yun Wei nodded. And before she could walk away, the boy took her hand and pulled her through the door. Here's the new girl, he announced so loudly that the teacher, Mr. Kokotis, almost dropped his glasses. Mr. Kokotis thanked, the, thanked him and greeted Yun Wei. Please welcome our newest student, he said to the class. She and her family just arrived from Korea last week. Yun Wei smiled broadly and tried not to show her nervousness. What's your name? Someone shouted. Yun Wei pictured the kids on the bus. Um, I haven't picked one yet, she told the class, but I'll let you know next week. As Mr. Kokotis showed her to her desk, she felt many round, curious eyes on her. Why doesn't she have a name? She heard someone whisper. Maybe she robbed a bank in Korea and needs a new identity, a boy replied. Later that day, Hyun Wei and her mother went grocery shopping in their new neighborhood. They passed Fadil's Falafel, Toadie's Pizza, and Dot's Deli. A big graffiti-painted gar garbage truck roared like a lion and took off down the street. Nothing sounded or looked familiar until they got to Kim's Market. The sign was in both Korean and English. Her mother picked up cabbage to make kimchi, a Korean-styled spicy pickled cabbage, and other vegetables and meat. She also found some seaweed, Hyun Wei's favorite, for soup. It made Hyun Wei smile. Just because we moved to America, said her mother, doesn't mean we stop eating Korean food. At the checkout counter, a friendly man smiled at Hyun Wei. Uh, helping your mother with the shopping, he asked. Hyun Wei nodded. I'm Mr. Kim, he said. And what's your name? Hyun Wei, she answered. Ah, what a beautiful name. Doesn't it mean grace? Hyun Wei nodded. My mother and grandmother went to a name master for it, she told him. A graceful name for a graceful girl, Mr. Kim said as he put the groceries into bags. Welcome to the neighborhood, Yun Wei. That evening, Yun Wei stood in front of the bathroom mirror. Hi, my name's Amanda, she said cheerfully. Then she wrinkled her nose. Hi, my name's Laura. Hmm, maybe not. She smiled, her smile turned down. Nothing sounded right and nothing felt right. I don't think American kids will like me, she worried as she began to brush her teeth. Hi, my name is Shuji, she said in the mirror with a mouthful of toothpaste. The next morning, when Hoon Wei arrived at school, she found a glass jar on her desk with some pieces of paper in it. Hoon Wei took one out and read it aloud. Daisy. That's my baby sister's name, but you can use it if you want, said Cindy, who sat next to her. Hoon Wei took out the rest of the paper. Tamala, she read. I got it from a storybook, said Nate. She was smart and brave. Hyun Wei nodded and unfolded another piece. Wednesday? Yeah, you came here on Wednesday, said Ralph. 
Thank you for your help. A smile spread over Hyun Wei's face. Ralph quickly said, we'll put more names in it. You can pick whatever you like or pick them all and you'll have the longest name in history. At three o'clock, the bell rang for the end of the school day. Hyun Wei looked out the window and saw it was sprinkling. It's the same rain, she thought, but in a different place. She watched the other kids leaving in groups. Hey, a familiar voice called out to her. Hyun Wei turned around to see a curly haired boy again. I'm Joey, he said, and you? Don't you have any name? Yun Wei thought for a moment. Well, I can show you, she said, and she took out the small red pouch. She pressed the wooden block on the ink pad and then stamped it onto a piece of paper. This is my name stamp, she said. My grandma gave it to me. In Korean, I can use it as my signature when I open a bank account or I write a letter. And whenever I miss my grandma, I use it to fill a piece of paper. You wanna try it? She offered the stamp to Joey, and he carefully inked the stamp and pressed it hard on the paper. The red characters gleamed against the whiteness. Wow, that's beautiful, Joey said. Can I keep the paper? Sure, Hyun Wei said, and the two of them shared her umbrella as they walked to the school bus. Every day the jar got fuller and fuller with more names, and Hyun Wei read them all. She found new names she liked, like Miranda, Stella, Avery. They sounded interesting. I hope you choose the name I put in, Marco told her at snack time. I've put in three more, said Ralph, Madison, Park, and Lex. They're my favorite street names. Maybe you should close your eyes and draw a name, Rosie suggested. Ralph frowned. That's silly. What if she doesn't like the name she draws? Well, we didn't get to choose our names when we were born, did we? Rosie argued. Everyone thought about this. When Hyun Wei got home from school that day, her little brother ran and gave her a letter. It was from her grandma, and she opened it quickly. It said, to my Hyun Wei, I hope you are enjoying your new school and new friends. Be sure to help your mother and little brother. Here, the moon is up, but the sun is, but, the, but there, the sun is up. No matter how far, to, far apart we are, and no matter how different America is from Korea, you'll always be my Hyun Wei, your grandma forever. Hyun Wei took out her wooden stamp and filled a paper with it. She thought for a long time in front of the bathroom mirror. On Saturday, Hyun Wei walked to Mr. Kim's store. Mr. Kim was helping a customer and he looked up and greeted her. Hi, Hyun Wei. Hello, Mr. Kim, Hyun Wei replied. She felt as if she was back in her old neighborhood in Korea. Hey, said the customer turning around. It was Joey. Your name is Eun Hei, he said. With her, his eyes open wide, Hyun Wei looked quickly at Mr. Kim and then turned to Joey. She nodded slowly. Yes, it's pronounced Yun Hui, and it means grace, Mr. Kim ad added. Yun Hui, Joey said slowly, this time perfectly. It made Yun Hui smile. I'll have it ready for you tomorrow, said Mr. Kim to Joey. Thank you, Mr. Kim. See you Monday, Yun Hui, Joey said to her. He left before she could ask him why he was at the store. On Monday, Yun Hui came to class early to look at the names one last time, but the jar wasn't on her desk. Instead, there was just a single piece of paper, paper with a name on it. Yun Hui slipped it in her pocket. Where is your name jar? Ralph asked as soon as he saw it was gone. Well, I don't know, Yun Hui said. It, was on Mr. it wasn't on Mr. Kokotis's desk or on any other desk, and it wasn't on the counters or any of the shelves. As the other kids arrived, they, they helped look. Soon, Mr. Kokotis came in and Ralph shouted at him. The name jar is gone with all the names in it. Gone, Mr. Kokotis replied. With a look of concern, he asked Yun Hui, did you get a chance to read all of the names? Yun Hui nodded. She took a breath. I'm ready to introduce myself, she said. Yun Hui wrote her name in both English and Korean on the chalkboard. I liked the beautiful names and funny names you thought of for me, she told the class, but I realized that I like my name best, so I chose it again. Korean names mean something. Yun Hui means grace. Grace! Grace in high, shouted Ralph, and everyone tried to say it. Yun Hui said her name again, slowly and clearly, and soon the kids began to say it better. Even Mr. Kokotis, they applauded Yun Hui's choice. I was named after a flower, Rosie whispered to Yun Hui. Lots of American names have meaning too, Mr. Kokotis reminded everybody. When the class was dismissed, Yun Hui heard her friends say goodbye. Bye, Yun Hui, see you tomorrow. Goodbye, Yun Hui. Yun Hui said goodbye and then looked around for Joey, but he was already gone. Yun Hui, Yun Hui, come downstairs, mother called up to Yun Hui. Your friend is here. Yun Hui rushed down to see who she meant. 
There stood Joey, and in his arm was the name jar. Where did you find it? Hyun Wei asked breathlessly. Joey looked embarrassed. Um, well, I took it, but only because I wanted you to keep your own name, and you did. He reached in and pulled out the names. Do you want to keep them? He asked. Thank you. I'll keep them as a souvenir, Hyun Wei said happily, and she put the piece of paper from her pocket. Pulled, the, pulled out the piece of paper from her pocket. Do you want this back? Joey grinned. You can keep it. I'll return the name jar to the class. Maybe you could put some Korean nicknames in it for us. Names with good meanings. I could do that, agreed Hyun Wei. I've already got a Korean nickname, Joey said. Mr. Kim helped me choose it. Carefully, he pulled out a small silver felt pouch from his pocket, and then he took a, out a dark wooden stamp with beautiful Korean characters carved sharply into it. He pressed it on the ink pad and then pressed a piece of paper next to her name. Chinku, read Hyun Wei. That means friend. And Chinku smiled back. So I really like this story because I like to, the, the little girl's name and I like that she makes a friend at the end. But what I want to do, I want to know what happens next. I want to read a story about Hyun Wei and Joey just being friends. I don't only want to read stories about how it's hard to have a name that's different because that's true, but there's more to Hyun Wei than just the fact that she has a name that's hard for some American kids to pronounce. So maybe we could write a story together about what happens next in the friendship with Hyun Wei and Joey. Okay, so the next story I have for you is called The Most Beautiful Thing by Koa Kalia Yang. My grandmother is so old, no one knows how old she is. Not me, not my big sister doll, not my older cousin Lee. My father waits patiently when we try to guess her age. He's my grandmother's mother's ninth and youngest child, and even he does not know how old she is. We know that my grandma was born on the other side of the world, across a wide ocean. My grandma came from a time and a place where creatures lurked in the jungles, waiting to chase unwary children. She told us that she once looked into the gleaming eyes of a tiger and felt its hot breath on her face. The luckiest of the grandchildren got to help take care of grandma. Lee got to wash grandma's clothes by hand at the bathroom sink with sweet smelling pink soap. Dao got to wash grandma's soft brown back in the bathtub with a soapy cloth. And me, I got to clip her fingernails and toenails while grandma sat on her favorite stool in the light from the window. I can still feel the roughness of grandma's heels in my hand and the thickness of her toenails in between my fingers. I can see the bottoms of her feet, thick and broken and brown, with deep cracks filled with dirt from long and far away. Grandma told me that her mother and father died when she was a little girl. Grandma was just a child herself, but she had to take care of her two younger brothers and baby sister. I looked up at my grandma from the place where I sat at her feet, and I asked her, how did you get food for them? Grandma said, I didn't find enough food. We lived with hunger eating on us always inside. All my life with her, even with just her one tooth, Grandma never said no when we offered her something to eat. The ice cream truck was singing its song from down the street, and I looked underneath the couch for quarters. There were none, so I got ice cubes from the freezer, and I offered one to Grandma in my red plastic cup. She smiled at me. When I wanted a new dress to wear on the first day of third grade, my mother said she did not have enough money. She found some nickels and a dime in her purse and offered them to me. I bought hard peppermint candies from the neighborhood grocery on the corner of our block, and when I got home, I offered one to Grandma on the palm of my hand, and she smiled at me. At the round table with its shaky legs, I used my spoon to mix and mix in the center soup bowl we all shared. There were no pieces of meat, only bones and soft greens. My father said, the price of meat is too expensive at the market, me nab. I found a thick chunk of bone and I offered it to grandma on my spoon. She smiled at me. We had plenty of meat only when we celebrated Hmong New Year with our aunts and uncles and cousins. The old table was heavy with whole boiled chickens, more than our family could ever eat. After dinner, our bellies full, my cousins and I sat on the carpet around grandma as she told us stories. 
She always began, it was a long time ago and I was just a girl. As we listened, our eyes grew round. Grandma twisted her fingers one over the other to show us the hands of Pojnyang, jungle spirits the size of children looked like. She taught us how to listen for the cries of the fearsome Fimnu Vas by holding our breath until our hearts pounded with our ears. We were always sad when Aunt Chu called, time for the children to help clean up. On a cold day, when the snow blew into the window panes and the light was dim, I asked Grandma about the dirt in her feet. She told me she didn't have shoes after her mother and father died. She went shoeless to the mountains to tend to the family field. She ventured into the jungle to look for wild roots, bamboo shoots, and edible mushrooms. And one day she was chased by a tiger. As she had fled, her bare feet broke open on the fallen branches and she still ran blood and dirt mixing into clay with each step. I squeezed my feet in her, her feet in my arms and pulled them close to my heart, a hug for the hard road she's walked to get to me. Each year, cutting my grandma's nails went faster because I grew stronger and bigger and more able. Each year, grandma's feet felt smaller and smaller in my hands and lap. Her stories, too, slowed with the passing years. The pauses between her words grew long. Sometimes, as Grandma was looking for the words she lost to the years, I grew distracted from my tasks, looking at the toys on the floor that needed to be picked up, the unfinished schoolwork, or the younger children who needed to be bathed. Her deep, even breathing would call me back to the moment, only to find her eyes closed in sleep, one hand braced against the window to cradle her head. I grew unhappy with our life. I was tired of getting ice cubes from the freezer when I wanted ice cream. I was tired of never having a new dress for that first day of school. I was tired of gnawing on the bone in the soup when I wanted the meat for myself and my grandma. One evening, I studied my face in the bathroom mirror, wishing my teeth were straight. I came out of the bathroom and said, Mom and Dad, I want braces. Can I have them? My mother looked up from my nursing baby sister and said, We don't have any money. Maybe next year? My father looked up from my toddler sister. He was bouncing on his legs and said, I wish we could get you braces, Mina, but we can't, not right now. My grandmother looked up from her special window and stood by the special stool by the big window and said, Kalia, she said, look at me. I turned to her in the glow of the early evening. The sun was low in the sky and its golden light fell on her face. Grandma asked, is my smile not beautiful? And in that moment, I could see all the times my grandma had smiled at me. I could taste cold ice cubes that melted summer's heat from our tongues and the sweetness of the hard peppermint candies and the deep flavors of the bone broth and the bowls of boiled greens. Even now, I can still see my grandma's single tooth, white against the shadows, standing tall in her open mouth. Her smile was the most beautiful thing. This was written by a woman who lives in Minnesota, who is a Hmong woman whose family emigrated to Minnesota and she lives here now, where we are filming this. Okay, and my last book for you is Malala's Magic Pencil by a young woman who won the Nobel Peace Prize named Malala. And she wrote this about her experiences growing up. Do you believe in magic? When I was younger, I used to watch a TV show about a boy who had a magic pencil. If he was hungry, he drew a bowl of curry and it appeared. And he and his friend, if he and his friends were in danger, he drew a police officer. The boy was a little hero, always protecting people who needed help. How I wanted a magic pencil too. If I had a magic pencil, I would use it to put a lock on my door so my brothers couldn't bother me, stop time so I could sleep an extra, an hour, extra hour every morning, Erase the smell of the trash dump near our house. And I would use it to make other people happy. I would draw the most beautiful dress in the world for my mother, the best buildings in the valley for my father so he could open many schools where children would study for free. A proper ball so my brothers and I no longer had to play with an old sock stuffed with rubbish. Every night before I went to bed, I wished for a magic pencil of my own. And every morning I would wake up and check my cupboard, but the magic pencil was never there. One day I was throwing away potato peels and eggshells at the dump. 
I was wrinkling my nose, swatting away flies, and making sure I didn't step on anything dirty in my nice shoes when I saw a girl about my age sorting trash into piles. Nearby, boys were fishing for metal scraps using magnets on a stick. When my father returned home from work, I told him what I'd seen. It made him sad. Abba, he, I asked. Yes, Johnny, he asked back. I always liked it when he called me dear one. Why haven't I seen that girl in my class? Because, he said, and he didn't finish right away. Because, Johnny, in our country, not everyone sends their daughters to school. And some children must work to support their family. If they went to school, their families would go hungry. School was my favorite place. I had never considered myself lucky to be able to go. My father always said, Malala will live free as a bird. And now I wondered how free I'd truly be. That night, I thought about families who didn't have enough food and about a girl who couldn't go to school and even about how, when I was older, I'd be expected to cook and clean for my brothers because where I came from, many girls weren't allowed to become what they dreamed of. I knew that if I had a magic pencil, I would use it to draw a better and more peaceful world. First, I would erase war, poverty, and hunger. And then I would draw girls and boys together as equals. Over the next few years, instead of wishing for a magic pencil every night, I worked hard in school every day. I wanted to be one of the top students in my class. But soon, powerful and dangerous men declared that girls were forbidden from attending school. They walked the streets of our cities now, and they carried weapons. One by one, girls stopped coming to school. Abba, where are all the students? They don't feel safe here anymore, Jani. How could a few men stop all the girls in our valley from going to school? If more people knew what was happening to us, I thought they might help. Wishing wasn't enough. Someone needed to speak out, and why not me? I wrote about what it felt like to be scared to walk to school, and how some of my friends had moved away because of the threat they faced in our city. I wrote about how much I loved school and how proud I was of my uniform. Once I started writing, I didn't stop. I wrote speeches, and I traveled around my country sharing my story. I even talked to a reporter from a famous international newspaper. People actually wanted to learn about my life. I spoke for all the girls in my valley who couldn't speak for themselves. My voice became so powerful that the dangerous men tried to silence me, but they failed. And now my voice is louder than ever, louder because people have joined me and together we make a chorus standing up for what we believe. We raise our voices for those in need, help people in danger even if they're an ocean away, and think of the world as a family. Do you still believe in magic? I do. I wrote alone in my room, but people all over the world were reading my story. Millions now know it would now it now excuse me, millions now know it and help me spread my message of hope. I had at last found the magic I was looking for in my words and in my work. I am Malala. I've always wished I could make the world a more peaceful place. And every day I work to make my wish come true. One child, one teacher, one book, and one pen can change the world.